Hello, friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Before we take you to your favorite Sports History Network show, just want to tell you a little bit about some merch that you can pick up that represents your favorite SHN podcast. So far, there's t-shirts, coffee mugs, and even books from some of the authors that do podcasts right here on SHN. Who could buy something better than that than have the history right from the, the gentleman that you hear talking about it? But we also are adding things each and every day. And where's that store, may you ask? Well, it's at SportsHistoryNetwork.com. Up at the top, there is the SHN. HN merch button. Click on that. It'll take you right to the store and you can be representing your favorite podcast and show the world that, hey, on the swag that I'm using, it's the headquarters of sports yesteryear, Sports History Network, and my favorite podcaster, the Sports History Network store. Shop there today. In this edition, we're time warping back into the 19th century as we look at the history of one of the best early professional football teams, the Duquesne Country and Athletic Club of the late 19th century. And we got their story and more coming up in just a moment. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. So as we come out of the tunnel of the Sports History Network, let's take the field and go no huddle through the portal of positive gridiron history with pigskindispatch.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pigpen, your portal to positive football history. And welcome back to me, to the Pigpen. We've had a, a rough week of being on the IR this past week, and uh, now I'm all recharged and ready to go. And we're going to bring you some great podcasts and some great blog posts this week on PigskinDispatch.com. And we would love to start off with a, a great a theme to the week of an early, early, early pro football team. This is one of the first, and I think you're going to enjoy it. It is the Duquesne Country and Athletic Club. We've talked a little bit about them before in some other segments. Uh, when Greg Fasseri has been on a few times, he has talked about them extensively as they were one of the precursors uh, to what we know know as professional football. Now, this team appeared in our post to pro football history over and over again the 1890s Duquesne Country and Athletic Club teams. The DC and AC is what we're going to call them for short. First put a football team on the field in the year 1895. And if you remember, this is the same year that the Latrobe Athletic Club paid college student John Brailler to be their quarterback for a few games. Now, this Duquesne club was right there at the beginning as pro football was sprouting. And what a part they partook in the paid level of the game's advancement. The story of the D.C. and A.C. starts with the establishment of the club charter sometime in the early 1890s as a social and recreation organization in the Pittsburgh area. Now, these types of clubs were becoming pretty common in that era as workers in the industrial sectors of America, like Pittsburgh with all the steel mills and other industrial uh, things going on there, they need to blow off a little bit of steam after work. And this is just the first time ever that men were starting to have a little bit of free time you know, recently uh, there were some changes to the hours that uh, workers could be worked. So they, you know, they would have a little bit of free time and maybe having a weekend off. And they wanted to keep themselves fresh and, uh, you know, in shape and healthy and healthy in mind. So they had these industrial clubs or, I guess, community clubs such as the Duquesne Country and Athletic Club after the long hours of work each day. Now, the club at first intended to only use amateur players on the roster when they set out in the 1895 season. And after four games, they saw some early success. And with this, it gave the team a sense of urgency to hire on some even better players uh, before they played the Pittsburgh Athletic Club, who did have professional players. So they went on and they ended up hiring some of these pro players from around the area, paying them to come and for their services, mercenary football players, as you will. Now, the practice continued the next year when they sought and contracted even more compensated roster members, making them one of the most professional football teams in the land in that 1896 season. Now, only five players returned to the team for 1896, and the heavy losses of personnel created lineup issues for many of the early games in the 1896 season. On November 10, 1896, the DC and AC became the first opponents to have ever faced a fully professional football team. 
That was the Allegheny Athletic Association. And the AAA paid a reported average of $100 per game to their roster members. The DC and AC lost this game 12 to nothing at Exposition Park, which was their home field, but it's uh, set a motivation in motion to improve their roster. The AAA, well, they could not sustain that hefty payroll and immediately ceased operations after shutting out the Pittsburgh Athletic Club a day after playing a DC and AC. It didn't last very long with that $100 per game per member. Now, the season ended on a high note for DC and AC uh, with wins over the Pittsburgh Athletic Club and Greensburg AC, who who provided the DC and AC team a claim as the top of the big four of the Western Pennsylvania Athletic Clubs with Greensburg, Pittsburgh Athletic Club, and Latrobe all included. Now, they were brought back to a a reality check, though, when their best pure football team in the area, a college team, the Washington and Jefferson Presidents, Blanked them on Thanksgiving Day, so it sort of set them back a, a bit there. But hey, they they got to know what was going on uh, with their how good their football team could be. So they ended up with an eight and three record overall that season. But there was a new team owner that came in in the off season, William Chase Temple, a former Pittsburgh Pirates baseball team minority owner. He took over control of the Duquesne Country and Athletic Club, becoming the first individual team owner in professional football in 1897. We'll get more on how he did that in just a moment. And he saw promise in his team and felt his knowledge and experience could build something special. Temple had left the realm of baseball a few years earlier after he felt a bit disrespected by those in baseball. See, he founded an award called the Temple Cup, a trophy given to the winner of the annual Best of Seven Postseason Championship Series for the American Professional Baseball uh, from 1894 to 1897. Sort of a precursor of what we would think of today as winning the pennant. You know, the competing teams were from what we call today the National League. But at the time, and since its creation in 1876, it was known as the National League of Professional Baseball Clubs. The 30-inch tall cup award was donated by Temple himself and cost about $800 at the time, equivalent to approximately just over $24,000 in today's money. It was a serious trophy, and Temple took it very serious. But quite a substantial sum, no matter when and what, when station in life is. In other words, he took that award so seriously and it didn't go quite to plan for Temple though as they seemed to lack the genuine enthusiasm on the part of the players and the other owners. Their apathy spread to the fans and made attendance at the Temple Temple Cup games in the latter years be very disappointing. An interest in the series faded quickly as the second place team had won three of the four series that took place for the Temple Cup, sort of discrediting the whole process of the season in the fans' eyes. Thus, Temple turned his efforts and money toward the blossoming game of professional football. The Duquesne Country and Athletic Club was Temple's first gridiron investment of time and resources in 1897, and the DC and AC had become the best professional team in Pennsylvania, equivalent to the best in the world in Temple's time there. And after the 1897 season, the club signed several good players to contracts for the following season. The ending of the Spanish-American War brought an even more significant influx of talent as the soldiers returned home, and Temple capitalized on this and built the strongest of all the Pennsylvania teams. Now that 1897-11 started off the season by winning their first seven games, including a 4-0 victory over the Pittsburgh Athletic Club, and they may have peaked a tad early as they dropped three of their last four contests to the likes of the Greensburg Athletic Club, Detroit Athletic Club, and Washington Jefferson football teams again seemed to be a little bit of a bugaboo there at the end uh, for the DC and AC. And it was still a successful season though, as they registered another eight and three record. Now, that was just signs of great things to come. The plans for the 1898 season were even loftier than the season prior. You know, Temple had learned a lot. The players had learned a lot. The coaching staff had learned a lot. And many more players were contracted to play DC and AC football by Mr. Temple. Things were looking very promising for the team, too, until they were not. It was the uprise of the Spanish-American War, and it took away more than a few of those Temple recruits as soldiers in the war effort. This adverse situation elevated the skill set of William Chase Temple. He dug deep and found replacement players to fill the roster. And by all reports, some of these second-wave recruitment players may have been 
more talented than the ones originally sought after that turned soldier. Nobody knew how long that war was going to take. But the Spanish-American conflict ended in August, though, and the originals started funneling home, ready to play some football, too. William C. Temple filled the D.C. and A.C. roster with talent, and their payroll was expensive, a sum that was too much for the club itself to endure. So Mr. Temple, a man of integrity and honor, bankrolled the team himself, making him the first sole professional team owner in, in pro football. Now, the starting roster had the cream rise to the top. The ends on this team were Charlie Gelbert, formerly a Penn Quaker, and Walter Okeson, who had previously been the head honcho at La Trobe in 1897. There was Bill Church, a Princeton All-American selection, and Bill Farrer, another former Penn player, covered those tackle positions. Inside the interior line were guards P.J. Datz Lawler and Frank Smith from Brown University. Now, Temple poached these two men from the Elizabeth Athletic Club in New Jersey, probably their top team over there. Now, the center was G.A. Jennings, and he used to anchor the Bucknell 11. Ed Young returned to the Duquesne backfield in 98 with more fresh signings from the Penn Quakers program and their former team captain, Roy Williams, and quarterback C.S. Williams. Yale's C.P. Kiefer was the other halfback, and as we mentioned earlier, W.C. Temple filled their bench with players who could have been a formidable roster all their own. Star halfback of Brown University, John Daff Gammons, and end Tommy Randolph, tackle Otto Wagonhurst, and guard John Weinstein. And back Don McNeil were a few of these studs that were on the roster. The team looked to Roy Jackson for leadership on the field as he acted as both their captain and their coach. This assembled roster looked great on paper, but was even more dominant on the grass. And by season's end, they had secured a record of 10 wins, zero losses, one tie, and had only five points scored upon their stingy defense all season. The five points came in the same contest as the Penn State Collegians scored a touchdown in week five as part of an 18 to five DC and AC victory. Their sole imperfection arrived in the eighth week of the season when they played the Greensburg Athletic Club, one of their rivals, to a scoreless tie. There was no doubts to anyone in the football realm that the Duquesne 11 was the top dog in 1898. And by the time the 1899 season came around, they were in for a very similar uh, reaction as the previous year. There was a lot of uh, stableness there. Not a lot of fluctuation in the roster. As the team continued its dominance on the field, finishing with a perfect 10-0 record. No ties this year. And again, allowing only five points on the season. You know, ironically, that lone touchdown in 1899 was scored by the same team that did it in 1898. The Penn State Collegians. And uh, they got on the scoreboard again in the second to last game of the season, this time at a home game for Duquesne at Exposition Park there in Allegheny City, uh, which is now, which today we call the north side of Pittsburgh. And, you know, this would be, you know, a a very uh, encouraging year because uh, it was was just so dominating of, of the team. But it would be the last hurrah for the DC and AC success in football, though. The club itself yearned to go in a more of an amateur status and as the AAU was encouraging collegiate teams to avoid playing teams with pro rosters. So William Chase Temple didn't really agree with this so he sensed this in turn and as the DZ and AC roster were starting to fall apart and the paid players were asked to leave or play for free of course they didn't want to do that if you can paid for a couple years. Temple defected to the Homestead Library and Athletic Club and took many of his former Duquesne stars with him. Now, if you look back a couple weeks ago, we talked with Greg Fasseri, author of Gridiron Legacy, uh, the NFL's untold origin story, and this DC and AC team and the Homestead Library team are both talked about quite a bit in Greg's book and in our conversation we have with Greg, and I think you'll really enjoy it because they're precursors to what would become the origin of the NFL and pro football. So I, I think you, you'll really enjoy that. And I'm, I'm glad you stayed with us here and, and listened to this story because it's really an interesting one. And uh, I, I think you'll really enjoy hearing that Homestead Library also if you've not listened to it yet. 
you can go to pigskindispatch.com and just go in the search box homestead library and uh, you should pop right up for you or go to our post today here on duquesne's country and athletic club go to the very bottom and there will be a link there that'll take you to the homestead library so we hope you enjoyed this and hope you join us back each and every time we have a new post on pigskin dispatch and a new podcast which is three or four times a week and uh, we look forward to bringing you football history until next time everybody have a great gridiron day Peeking up at the clock, the time's running down. We're going to go into victory formation, take a knee, and let this baby run out. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back tomorrow for the next podcast. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey there, sports history fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know, that can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at sportshistorynetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you got to do, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.